Hello everyone, welcome to Neo Reality Collective, a very special video for this day. For you see, we have a special guest with us. We have comic book creator and writer Steve Orlando with us, who is currently writing the currently recently started Commanders in Crisis and has written some other works like Justice League of America during its rebirth days, Supergirl, Batman, Batman and Robin Eternal with James Tyron and and Scott Snyder. Or how do you like to? Uh, how do you want to start this off, man? Oh man, I've been all over. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of time at DC, but uh, breaking out this year into original stuff. So as you said, like we just launched Commanders in Crisis at Image, uh, but it's informed a lot by my experience in the past five years uh, when I was at DC. Which yeah, it's everything you said. Uh, Batman in the Shadow, Martian Manhunter, probably my favorite thing I've ever done there. Uh, maybe all I ever will do, uh, but but I've been taking everything I learned there, working with those big name characters and doing my own thing this year, uh, both at Image and a lot of other places too. So I was a guy, you know, I, I'm here to uh, answer all your questions. We, we, we can go in any direction you want. Well, um, I have a, well, I have a question. So the Commanders in Crisis stories, when I first read the first issue, I was thinking, hey, okay, besides all of them being presidents of, of Earth or something like that, I was thinking to myself, you know, I am curious to know if we'll get flashback scenes of their previous worlds before they were viciously destroyed in what is very subtle a crisis event. Uh, almost definitely. Well, I can say definitely. I mean, there's, there's a flashback in issue two, and then we want to do more as the series goes on. Uh, cause a lot of what it's about is the, is perceived power and, and limitations and, and the, the sort of decisions you have to make. Um, the reaction to the characters being presidents from the multiverse was certainly strong, but that's sort of the idea. Uh, you know, like we look at that as a powerful position, but there's so much responsibility and, and, and so many impossible decisions that come with it that it can really erode someone's will. Uh, and, and sometimes you don't have the power you think if you look at how a president can be stonewalled. So a lot of the book has been about sort of what we perceive uh, as, a ways, as ways to, of making change versus how to actually make change, how you can actually affect the world. And, and we have to go back and look when it's appropriate at how they failed in the past or succeeded uh, in their previous in their previous lives. So we are going to do it in issue two a little bit. Uh, we're going to do it more as the series goes on, and hopefully, if we can spin off into solo runs, we can we can dig into that even deeper. Oh, I was actually going to ask about: uh, Would there ever be a story sometime in the future where the heroes had given the opportunity to restore their lost worlds? Well, uh, you know, any story is possible, you know, and every, and every story is possible, though I think that in the world of Commanders in Crisis, we, there's no do-over, you know, so there's a question about what's going on with the multiverse, but at the same time, we're trying to look at these comic tropes a little differently yeah. uh, than, than they've always been looked at at, 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 the, at big two companies, because, you know, yeah, obviously the multiverse has died and been reborn and recreated and reshuffled more times than a deck of cards. Uh, and, and so, yeah, there might be new life, uh, for the multiverse, who knows where it's going to end, uh, you know, come issue 12, but I don't know that it'll be the same, uh, you know, because we are trying to approach the expectations of an event and these sort of tried and true concepts in new ways. So, yeah. uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, and, and in real life, of course, and superheroes tend to be a reflection of real life. There is no do-overs. We can't go back. We can only go forward. Uh, and so that's sort of how we're trying to approach these characters as well. Something that you wouldn't be able to be given to do with DC and Marvel because DC and Marvel likes to have the habit of killing off their characters and then bringing them back after like a couple of years. Uh, well, yeah, even, even Bucky and Jason Todd came back in my lifetime and they told me that would never happen. So, yeah. um, and there was, and I recall Infinite Crisis, they wanted to kill off Dick Grayson, which I thought was a terrible idea and they wanted to make it stick, and I was like, that wouldn't work, but. Well, those things only stick until someone has a good idea to unstick them, that you know? That fan demands wanting to see them again, and I'm pretty sure it would have been very bad with fans if they killed off Robin like that, the original Robin. Permanently, for sure, but you know, we always knew. I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, Bruce is, even Bruce has died I, at least twice, you know, and, and gotten better. So, yeah, like... He did die the first time. He died, then went back in time, and that was confusing. 
Yes, it was. It wasn't complicated at all. You know, he was sent back in time and replaced with a clone that looked like him. Happens to every. It can happen to me. It could happen to anyone, anytime, any day. Yeah, and I had looked up that, and I had recalled that you did work on Martian Manhunter. How was that series working on him while the year of the villain stuff was going on? I mean, it was great. Martian Manhunter is my favorite character at in you know at DC Comics, uh, and luckily we weren't really beholden to anything going on in the main series because much like something like the killing joke or mr miracle like we were allowed to tell our own story so it was exciting that the year of the villain and just league stuff was going on because there was a big spotlight on the martian manhunter that we were able to sort of piggyback off of but we got to tell our own story exactly as we wanted to and you know as i had said in the opening it's my favorite thing i've done at dc so um, the best experience I've had there, the best response from readers. Uh, I, I'm super proud of that book, even now, a couple years later. Yeah, I, I have heard a lot of critical love and, and love and enjoyment for that book. I was originally going to start getting them, but then by the, by the time it happened, the issues were almost finished, and I was like, I'll just wait for when they make an eventual deluxe hardcover, because that was very popular. Uh, well, it's, I mean, you're not good. There's probably not going to be a hardcover, but the collected is out now. So you can, I mean, and there's a lot of good stuff in it. We, uh, and you know, I'm proud of how he presented making comics in that book too. It's one of the few things that DC's done where, you know, we let, we had the creative team interview each other and I was able to include, uh, I was able to include like the editorial team as well. Uh, because I do, you know, they were a big part of making that book happen and fighting for the content of the book. So the collected edition does have stuff you haven't seen, like as back matter goes, uh, compared to the periodical series. And also just, I'm very proud that we're able to really show that it is a collaboration. It's not my book. It's not Riley's book. Like a whole team came together to make that. And that's sort of why I do comics versus prose. Uh, but when it works out, like in Martian Manhunter, and we're all in the same wavelength, it's, it's really, really special. So I'm proud of that collected edition. We got stuff that no other collected edition has done. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I, and like, and then I had also recalled that when you were working on Supergirl um, during the Rebirth era, how was it working in that era with Rebirth and, and under the Jeff Johns days when he was the chief creative officer and you got the chance to work with Supergirl and even do her Rebirth one shot? Uh, Rebirth was a really fun era to be part of because there was great energy and great excitement among the fans, you know, that we were, we were finding a way to welcome people back that had maybe stepped away for a little while, but also push these stories forward, uh, you know, and, and it was incredibly challenging, um, but at the same time, it was great for me, uh, specifically on Supergirl, to discover the love that, for this character that exists as when I started researching her, uh, because, it, you know, my age... When I was growing up, Supergirl was not like Kara Zor-El. It was the it was the Earth Angel version uh, from from the 1990s, and so this the Kara Zor-El character is something that I really was excited to discover as I as I dug into the back issues and and started to realize this huge wealth of support and emotional connection people have for her, and they were just happy to have her back uh, and 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 sort of focus in a way that I was really proud of on, on what makes her different than Superman or her different experience. Like a lot of people think that she's just a sidekick, but I'm proud of the fact that we showed that she does have a different experience. They're both immigrant experiences, but she has a very different one than his. And every time we got to put them together and show that family bond and show the contrast, you know, she's gone from being the person who's supposed to be his babysitter uh, to she wakes up here and, and he's the, you know, the greatest hero that, that the world's ever known, you know? And yeah. so, there's a big cut. There's a lot of there's a lot of surrealism with Supergirl the way she sees the world and her getting adjusted that I think is really special. Uh, and yeah, I, I was really excited to be part of that book at that time and just do things that to this day like our issue 18 where we featured a non-binary character for the first time, issue 14 where she got to meet uh, the new Superman from China. Just stuff that to this day I look back and I'm really really proud of. Yeah, and. Okay, and regarding on the on one last part of the DC, two more things on the DC side. Uh, how was it working on Wonder Woman? Because I got into the Wonder Woman books again when I realized, oh wait, the guy's trying Donna Troy, and Donna Troy is the character that I wish had her own series of books. I think a lot of people do. Um, listen, Diana is a great character. She's probably number two for behind Martian Manhunter for me uh, because it is. I mean. 
it's an extremely challenging character to write. You know, she has, she, she's, she's a warrior for peace. Uh, and so we, it's a real opportunity when you get on that book to think about what that means. And the answer changes all the time. You know, the answer was one thing in the eighties. It's one thing in the nineties. It's one thing now. But the thing about these characters is that their, their core beliefs don't really change. So it's, 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 it's great to take a character like Diana, whose number one obligation is to the truth and, and to love and really contrast that, uh, you know, via super, super villain type threats against the world of today. And I, I loved, you know, both runs on Wonder Woman being able to do that and sort of challenge those notions because, uh, you know, truth means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Uh, and I was really, really happy that we could come back, work Donna back in and show how she's different as, a, you know, than Diana in many ways and how she does sort of, you know, she lets herself be a little more human than Diana does. Uh, and, and in many ways we identify with her in a really unique way because of that. Uh, so I was happy to bring her back. I wanted to have time for Cassie, but we didn't have time for that. Um, but I, I think that that, whole, that that core dynamic, that Diana's priorities are a little different than the other ones in the Trinity and the other heroes of the DC universe is always going to be really strong. And you've seen that in Mariko's run, which has been awesome uh, following me as well. Yeah, um, I've been reading those issues where Maxwell Lord, that in one previous continuity, she broke his neck. We all remember that era. Yeah. And, and I'm curious as to know if they'll ever address that because as the reboots happen and Doomsday Clock fi try to fix everything and all, all that craziness that happened, I wonder if they'll ever bring up, oh, wait, in one timeline, you, you, you killed Maxwell Lord. Yeah, I think she's been remembering it uh, in the most recent issues. So I think they're definitely, they're definitely on their way there. But, you know, I'm, you know, I'm interested to see how they thread the needle. Yeah. And if you were given the opportunity, if you ever go back to DC, what, what set of character, what, what character would you like to do either a special series on or a regular run with? Well... You know, I loved the Justice Society of America, and they were never in continuity while I was at DC, uh, and that was a big bummer. Because, uh, of course, a blue man went ahead and erased them. Uh, yeah, and uh, <laughs> among other things. But, uh, but the nice thing is, is that I, ended up did, I did end up getting to work with them in the, one of the Dark Multiverse one-shots that's coming out in December. So I sort of... I got to work with them a little, but I still would love to go back. I'd love to do a Wildcat series. I'd love to do a Sandman series, Wesley Dodds. Uh, like, I really love the, the sort of the pulpy, at this point, neo-noir sort of aspects of those characters. And I thought I'd be satisfied getting to work with them a little bit, but it only made me want to do more. So if, if, if I do ever go back, the hope is that I can work with them. And I'd love to do more with a lot of the Wildstorm characters that I didn't get to use uh, when I was there. I love the Wildcats uh characters for example yeah. uh so you know we'll see there's infinite potential in 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 marvel and dc you just gotta you gotta have the right support and you gotta have the right take that shows people why maybe a character they've never thought was cool before is really cool as hell yeah especially since wildstorm does seem to be coming back to dc since grifter showed up in batman uh, yeah, and more to come, more to come, I'm sure, uh, based yeah, on... Yeah, I, I, I actually I'm, did try to also get James Tyron to be interviewed on this show. Oh, but he's but I haven't gotten back a response if, he, if he's busy or not. But I always, for some reason, inadvertently on YouTube, call his name either James Tyron the Fourth or James Tyrion the Fourth because I watch Game of Thrones. Yeah, but it's, it's actually Tynan with an N, so it, I would make sure that you're you're reaching out... <laughs> uh with uh with with the right uh with the right pronunciation and uh he's uh, obviously that's a struggle for him that's ongoing i'm sure it'll help you out but james is a great guy he will he will come out in the future i'm sure yeah and and now a question uh yeah i noticed you didn't work at marvel you didn't you haven't done any marvel works would you be interested in working like anything going on at Marvel, like the Don of X stuff by Hickman, who I honestly think is Jeff is the Jeff Johns of Marvel at this point? Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I, I would love to. I didn't work at Marvel because I was exclusively with DC for four years. Yeah. So I couldn't. And then I actually did have a book announced uh, that was a, a mini event called Darkhold that was featuring Scarlet Witch and Doctor Doom, among some other people. Uh, that, you know, we were rolling on that. Unfortunately, uh, we got hit by the pandemic. 
Uh, and we, yeah, that was rough. That's been rough on everyone. Yes. But folks may end up seeing that, uh, in the future as well. We're still talking about that. And I've been talking to Marvel about some other things that you'll hopefully see in this, in the spring of next year. So yeah, I would love to do that. And I think what Hickman has done with the X titles is incredible. Uh, I would love a chance to do something similar with, you know, a, a pocket of that universe that isn't, that hasn't been touched in a while. I'm equally excited by the way, for what Kieran, uh, and Asad Rivik are going to do on Eternals. Uh, I don't know what it is, by the way, but I'm but I'm excited for to see how they differentiate those characters now. The mutants are having their heyday. Yeah, it's currently been delayed till next year. However, it's been delayed till January. But It'll the only out. thing I have noticed is that they are bringing back Thanos, who I've lost track of the continuity, so I didn't even know he was dead for a time. Oh, Thanos is Thanos always be dying, man. Yeah, but you know the love of his life keeps bringing him back at this point. Uh, yeah, it's a tale as old as time. No, I, I think there's a ton of opportunity at Marvel, like I said, and you'll see what I'm doing pretty soon, uh, hopefully pretty soon at least. Um, but I love those characters. I was, you know, the first books I bought off the rack actually were Marvel books. Uh, it was, it was Web of Spider-Man. Uh, and the first books I bought ever, even though they weren't off the rack, were West Coast Avengers. So I, I love those characters. I mean, uh, it's, I'm in a great place right now because I'm, I'm not on contract and I can sort of go wherever is most interesting and, and wherever yeah. is the most challenging. So I think you'll see me, uh, you'll definitely see me there, uh, and hopefully some new places you don't know about yet as well. Yeah. And well, the last thing regarding Marvel, since you mentioned the Scarlet Witch, if you were given the chance by editorial to say, oh, Scarlet Witch, she's no longer in a superhuman, she's back to being a mutant, would you want to do that? You know, and that would add a dynamic regarding her relationship with Kakoa because she's declared an enemy of state and called the pretender. Yeah, I mean, it's tough, man, because the thing is, is that that's been changed so many times. My, my initial instinct is that we just have to let it lie uh, because it has become so confusing uh, to many people. Uh, but the real answer is if there's a great story in it, if she's more interesting as a mutant uh, than she is as... Uh, whatever her current backstory is, uh, but a non-mutant superhuman, uh, then I would pursue it. But it really depends on the story that's built around it. I think having to have her deal with the consequences of her actions as she does in Dawn of X is very interesting. Uh, and so it would have to be equally compelling uh, to me and for you guys for her to make a change to that. Yeah, and... Since you've done a lot of work outside of the big two, like with Image or with your Commanders in Crisis series, Ares, and all your original own works, here's a question. If you ever got the idea, um, if they ever thought about, if you ever did thought about using Commanders in Crisis later down the road after your first 12 series, which does talk about this big mystery regarding the death of um, Empathy, was it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was thinking to myself, you know, it, it would kind of actually be funny funny if, if they did a route later down the road in that established universe he's making that they that you would, like, bring, like, make all your original works part of the Steve Orlando multiverse. Well, I can say that all of my superhero work going forward is definitely going to be part of the shared world. Uh, and so I, I've thought about it, and it's just a question of how to fit it in. You know, like, the books that don't fit in stylistically uh things like virgil uh that i did image or undertow like you know there's still ways to make them relevant it could you could do something i've considered sort of positioning it the way the dc positioned earth uh their their pre their other earths before the crisis where basically yeah. like that you know the characters on one earth read books and stories about the other yeah what i did so uh, when I was at DC. So there's certainly ways. I don't know that everyone would quite, would literally be in the universe because again, I, you know, I didn't have a superhero universe when I did Undertow or Virgil or Crude. Yeah. Uh, like, I, I don't, I don't really see, see a lot of them mixing in one Earth. I mean, like in multiple Earths, if you ever thought about bringing back the multiverse, but it's new and different with all your other works. Yeah, like I said, there's definitely a way to do it. And I just got to figure out the way that is most unique and says something new. Yeah. It can be found. So hopefully we, we were able to continue and uh, we can answer that question. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing how your series goes and see how you could do with the future characters after the story. And okay, so if you have checked out my channel, 
I am not a fan of Dan DiDio, but I, I got to ask, what was it like working with him since he did give an introductory note on your Commanders in Crisis book? Yeah, I mean, Dan, uh, I, I, can't, I can't dance around it. He's been one of my biggest supporters, and I owe him all of my best work at D.C., uh, so, I mean, he can, has strong opinions and strong opinions exist around him for sure. Uh, but, you know, I've always found him very, he's always been incredibly supportive of me, obviously. That's why he stepped out to write the intro. Uh, and he's always been supportive of the stories I want to tell. So I can't say that I've had anything but a great experience with him. But yeah, I mean, he, there's things he just doesn't like. There's, there's strong opinions that he has and, and. You know, that can be challenging for people for sure, but also I think it makes them a real person. You know, they're, in any type of entertainment business, you get a lot of people. Yeah, I get that. It's just, it's just when my opinion with Dan is like, like, okay, he doesn't have to like certain characters, but when he denies a thing, when, when, okay, so there were certain characters that I've always heard for years he doesn't like, like Nightwing and Wally West, and, and I go like... Look, I don't. I know you don't like him. You, and no one's telling you to like him. You don't have to like him. But, but I, when you when I hear the stories of, but it says you want to get rid of them. It does kind of seem unfair to those who have grown up with Wally West and Nightwing, and those who want to see more stories told about them. And then you're saying, oh no, well these characters don't matter anymore to me because I say it doesn't matter, and fans get mad about that. Yeah, but what I would say about that is, is you are just hearing stories. Uh, yeah. You know, and and with the one of the best things about Dan is that he knew that as the uh, president or whatever figurehead role he had, uh, he was taking it all on himself. So the one thing I will say is that, um, you know, a lot of folks think that everything that they don't like is attributed to Dan. And that's because as a boss and someone who was leading a company of hundreds of people, uh, he took the heat whether it, his, whether it was his idea or not. So all I would say about some of those things is you never really know as a reader where an idea comes from. You know, folks have, everyone uh, in the office has their own biases, uh, you know, but it always seems that it's him because he's made himself the figurehead. And that's, ne you know, it, it can be positive or negative, but it does mean that we knew if we did something, all of us, you know, for the most part, that he would have our backs once it was done. So it's yeah, kind of like I, I do recall that besides him supporting you, he's also one of the reasons why we got Peter uh, T. T Johnson, if I pronounced his name right, the, the writer who wrote Superman that many people like to say was a legendary run during Rebirth. Yeah, uh, Peter Tomasi. Yeah, no, yeah, Peter Tomasi. Um, you know, those characters. It can be really challenging, uh, but you know, not all of the, <laughs> not all of the things that are attributed to Dan are actually Dan's real opinions or actions. But it, yeah, I know. I mean, like the reason why he's now why he's become a writer because I did recall he was an editor for a time. I mean, he was an editor. He was a TV producer. He got into the company as a writer, writing Superboy. Yeah. Uh, but so look, I mean, anyone with strong opinions is at the company for decades is going to be divisive for sure. Uh, so I, I would never stand in the way of someone else's opinion, but I can only talk about my own experience. And yeah. Something that was very positive. Um, and there are a lot of other concepts that, you know, never even reach you guys, uh, that he, that are popular, that he stood up for and, and that's the converse. So that's kind of the challenge, you know, when you're the public figure and you're the target, everybody always hears the negatives, but you never hear about the fires that ever reach you guys because they never blow up. You know, you never know the concepts that he saves. Yeah. Uh, because you, you never knew they were in jeopardy. Yeah. And, and the, okay. So if you were to be given the chance, if you were to go into like TV or movie, would you like your work adapted for those mediums beyond just comics? If you ever went outside of comics? Uh, of course. Uh, and it's not because I make a book that I am just like, you know, hungry and thirsty that it becomes a TV or a movie or something. But I would because I don't do a book if I, if I don't think it has something important to say. Uh, and with respect to films or animation or television, that's a much wider audience. So if I'm doing a book that I think is important and I don't do a book that I don't think is important, of course, I would love something to put a wider mouthpiece on it, you know, but I would also be totally fine letting folks for whom that's their passion, uh, do the adaptation. 
Uh, like yeah. I'm a guy who wants to make comics, first and foremost, I would love to write TV every once in a while and so on and so forth. But the thing for me is like these things that I do are for a reason and I think they have something powerful to say. So if someone wants to come along and put a megaphone on that in a different format, I'm all for it. I'm going to use that uh, to, to make more comics for as long as I can. Yeah, I totally get that. Uh, I mean, I, I'm like, I, I would mention his name, but I'm pretty sure Alan Moore would probably not like what I say regarding his opinion on other people working on his stuff that he kind of has a history of not liking. But he has written some great works, but yeah, I get why sometimes he gets mad. But enough about Alan Moore and, and well, whatnot, yeah. but... Um, Alan Al has created some of the best comics in history. Uh, and, you know, as you said, he's entitled to his opinion. Yeah, uh, and and I get why he doesn't like people working on his stuff, because it's his creation. He doesn't, he feels like it's his work. I should be the one to decide what should be done with it. Sadly, the corporate world has a different mindset when it comes to ownership rights and everything. And and, and not every company is like Image or the other companies beyond the big two. I mean, there's no company like Image, so that that should be said. You know, if you want to own your if you want to own your things outright and have full control over them, it's Image. Yeah, it's it is unique, and you know, there wouldn't be the comics industry as you know it without them. Yeah, and I, I can only think like maybe a few people would probably get ownership rights of their work at, at DC or Marvel, like if you were a Graham Morrison or a Jeff Johns. No, none of them do. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. That's just not a thing that happens. You are no, no, no. If it was, if it was potential, like if they said, "I have a work I I, I want to own," DC would be like, "You are one of our best writers, and you have done a lot of great stuff. I, I we could consider it." That's just my viewpoint on on if you were like if you were like those writers who've done so much for DC and Marvel, and they would probably consider it best. Yeah. I'm not sure though. I, I'm not in the corporate world. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it, it's not a great deal uh, for them, but you would see things like the old Vertigo deal. Uh, what you do see is, um, without getting into it too much, like, you know, DC and Marvel are never going to just do a book that you own, uh, but they will do things where, like, for example, when it goes out of print, eventually the rights revert back to you. Yeah. You know, that's why you see... Uh, that's why you see a lot of Vertigo titles from the 90s are now being sort of repackaged, remastered, and re-released elsewhere. Uh, yeah. That was, that was an ideal deal back in the day, and uh, people are still hunting that deal even in 2020. Yeah. And what would you consider by many you thought was like, what, what and a work you, you did, but not many people read it, what do you feel like they should check out these days from the, your catalog of work? Uh, well, I mean, if you, I mean, to be quite honest, like if you haven't read Martian Manhunter, it's, it's, it's number, it's sales numbers were not super strong. So there's probably a lot of people out there that haven't read it. So I would always push people to that. But at the same time, if you loved it and you liked the, the, the work we did there, my, my book, Batman in the Shadow that I did with Riley Rossmo, uh, that is where we sort of met and cemented our relationship. And a lot of people haven't checked that out. It's also, I mean, Martian Manhunter is my favorite thing. Uh, but I love Batman in the Shadow with Riley Rossmo. And if you haven't read Crimes of Passion, actually my eight-page short with Greg Smallwood, uh, which is like a set in the, it looks like the 1930 serials that Batman did. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of that as well. I'm going to work with Smallwood. Uh, it was just a, a treat. Like, he's incredible. Uh, so, and a lot of people miss that because it's an anthology. So I would say to look at Crimes of Passion. I would say to look at Batman in the Shadow. Um, and honestly, Batman Secret Files 3, these are all random picks, but I got to work with Eduardo Riso, again, living legend, uh, and I would encourage people to check that out. It's a Hugo Strange story. Yeah. So, finally, here, here one last question uh, to end this off on. Um, what, okay, so you're going to be around for a long time. We all see that. I hope so. uh, what, what would be your future works you think, like after you finish Commanders in Crisis and some of the other works that are already in production? Uh, I mean, who knows broadly, but I will say that there's a ton of stuff that uh, hasn't been announced yet. So I can, you know, um, I have, I'm working on a monster blockbuster that hopefully will be out next year, like a big, like summer movie type book. Uh, that has like the universal style monsters in them. 
I have a YA fantasy book that's uh, really, really emotional and gorgeous. It's like a Disney movie as, as a 120-page graphic novel. That's coming out next year. I have, a, I have a gay horror slasher book that's coming out next year that has been announced. Uh, oh, man, what else? And Oh, and for like superhero fans, I have a book that's sort of one part like classic Silver Age Superman and one part Neon Genesis Evangelion. Oh, uh, I remember that. So that's all coming out next year and and you know i'm in the process of developing even more so plus as i said i've got an unannounced marvel project that you'll find out about very soon so yeah uh, and there's oh a man i just remembered something so in sure. doomsday clock issue 12 they mentioned one last thing this is the last thing of definitively sorry um they mentioned something called a secret crisis and they allude that a green behemoth stronger than hall stronger than uh than dark doomsday would would be involved and i was thinking Man, uh, what would what would you think if, if that does indeed happen? They're teasing of of Marvel and DC crossing over with a Secret Crisis event. What would I think if they did it? Yeah, um, and if you were given a chance to write a tie-in, what would you do? Uh, I would steer clear of the big fights because someone's always going to be angry. <laughs> yeah. I would love to write like I would love to write like the weird book, you know, if that were to happen. Like one of my favorite things I did at DC was when I got to write Doom Patrol, uh, and so like if it were me, I want to have like I don't know a, a crossover that you would never expect, like Doom Patrol and the Morlocks or something, you know, I would because you could do something really fun there, uh, and and also not necessarily have to worry about t you know settling a huge huge like, fight where someone's always going to be angry, you know, like... Yeah, or, or, like, a huge plot point that affects the main book. Like, it would just be like a, it's a fun crossover that's set during this event. And it can be strange, which is sort of what people have come to want out of me. So I would love, yeah, I would love to do... I would love to do Doom... You know, Morlocks is a weird pick. I would say I would love to do Doom and, like, the champion... Uh, excuse me, the Defenders, you know, which is always yeah. been a coffee team. And I just, you know, the idea of, like, Flex Mentello interacting with <laughs> with Doctor Strange and Silver Surfer or Namor in the classic lineup uh, is, is really entertaining to me. It'd be the Battle of the Speedos. But uh, I would love, so I would love to do like a wilder, uh, edgier meeting of the sort of counterculture type teams. Because there's always going to be those blockbuster fights and someone's always going to be angry. You know, does Cap win? Or yeah, does Cap I, I recall that some people were still mad about Marvel versus DC book from like the 80s, I think. Uh, well, yeah, and the thing about that was the fan voting, so it led to things that, you know, you know, it's been 20 years, so I'll say it led to things where the character was more popular but would never win from a narrative standpoint. Yeah. So you got to thread that needle, right? Uh, it's like booking pro wrestling. and, and, and Yeah, and, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. But I would love it, you know, uh, you know, I would love the opportunity to clash those those characters. And Marvel and DC still have a character they co-own from that event named Access. Uh, and the reason that he hasn't shown up is because one always has to pay the other if they use them and they don't want to. But uh, yeah. it would be fun. I think it'd be industry shaking if he showed up again. So we'll see what happens. All right. Um, so I think that's a, about it, honestly. Uh, that's all the questions I had and, and all the answers we've gotten. Um, is there anything you want to plug before we go? Yeah, well, I mean, as you talked about uh, and as we talked about, Commanders in Crisis is, my, is the biggest thing I've done. It's coming out from Image. It started last month. Issue 1 is out there. Uh, we had a great debut. Issue 2 is out uh, in the middle of October. Excuse me, in the middle of November. Excuse me, 2020. Time is a real thing. Uh, and we'll be, we'll be monthly, like clockwork, uh, until issue 12 when we wrap up. And hopefully we'll have already announced more stuff since then. But if you love the big uh, Marvel and DC type universes, but you want to get into the ground floor where there's no barrier to entry, whether it be 80 or 50 years, uh, wow, 60 years now, uh, you can do it. And you can do it with Commanders in Crisis. Uh, there's no rules. Everything that they told me I couldn't do for five years, I'm doing it in this book. So I'm very excited about it. All right. Well, everyone, that, this was Steve Orlando and Eric Brown of Neo Reality Entertainment. This was Neo Reality Collective special edition interview. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and donate. Stay tuned for more. And I'll see you all next time. And we are out.